welcome to this course. Uh, the title of the course is Adaptive uh, Methods for Data Vision Decision Making. It doesn't mean a lot by itself. Uh, it's kind of a general course for learning uh, how to use any arbitrary machine learning or statistics method in the right way. Meaning, how do you take into account of problems that you might have when you want to apply machine learning or AI techniques in real life? Specifically, what about you try a method, it seems to work, but then when you try it in the real world, it doesn't work? Or what about you try this complicated algorithm for uh, suggesting news to your clients, let's say Facebook, and then it ends up uh, being hijacked by Russian trolls that propagate fake news everywhere? Or how about you develop an algorithm for autonomous vehicles and you discover that when you deploy the algorithm, millions of cars crash uh, more than they used to without autonomous driving. So these are the kinds of things we want to look at in this course. And because there are a lot of technical details that we cannot really go over, uh, we will skip them. However, the methodology part, we will try and focus on instead. Okay? So we'll only look at technical details to explain how things work, go up to there. There will be no theorems, even though they're nice. Uh, for that, you can refer to other places. So right now, we'll focus on the first couple of days. we we'll focus a little bit more on standard machine learning problems. And for this, we'll go over very simple uh, Bayesian inference at some point, and very simple KRS neighbor, and very simple uh, neural networks. Okay, let's see. Why do you want to use machine learning or statistics in the first place? <coughs> well, the first basic idea of statistics is that you want to use this to analyze data in order to prove or disprove some theory. And this is the main scientific application of statistics and machine learning. So you can use statistics, for example, to uh, measure uh, disease prevalence, to measure cosmological constants, or to distribution of dark matter in the galaxy, or to examine uh, networks of, so of people, social networks, or to examine networks of uh, biological uh, components like proteins and the interaction with DNA. So these are the main scientific applications of statistics. And there are a couple of things that are important, and mainly two things. The first is interpretability. So let's say you build a complicated model of, let's say, the network of uh, proteins and DNA, you have to be able to interpret what this means. And the second is reproducibility. If you have some result that you claim is true, then somebody else should be able to do the same work that you did, maybe with different data, maybe with the same data, and get the same result. And that's the idea of reproducibility. And this is what we'll focus a little bit in the first part of the course. I think it's important no matter what uh, application you're looking at. But now in this course, we'll focus a little bit more on what are now pervasive intelligence systems. Now we see that a lot of applications of AI now are appearing in home assistants, where they just hear what you say and they basically try to discover what you want to buy. And you can buy stuff that you see on web advertisements, which look at what you actually do on the web and try and guess your interests. And maybe you don't have enough money to buy what you want. So actually there are also platforms that uh, target you in terms of lending, so how it's target advertising for lending. So there are AI platforms that are tailored for financial institutions that uh, say what kind of product you would be most likely to buy uh, in so that the bank or lending organization can make the maximum amount of money from you. Let's say you buy, let's say you buy a autonomous vehicle, fine, it seems to work okay, but it's hard to prove that these things are safe. Uh, when we test a vehicle, a mechanical vehicle, there are rigorous tests we do in every little component and then lots of test driving. But it's slightly different with autonomous vehicles. There you have a problem that uh, the behavior of a vehicle is not something independent of the behavior of the other vehicle, for example. And you might see, for example, that if you put a lot of vehicles of a specific type on the road, then this might change the whole dynamics of the complete system. And even in a simpler scenario, when you test with autonomous vehicles, you only test in a very, very limited uh, frame and in real life it can be very different. So what manufacturers are doing now with autonomous vehicles is they only certify them for very specific conditions 
Um, let's say very good weather uh, states in the United States uh, that are very flat, some of them anyway. I say that we can let's say we don't prove that it's safe everywhere, but we can prove it's safe for these conditions. You are allowed to use this vehicle there. Now, the vision of some of these companies is to use this for rat sharing. So you can have your autonomous car going around and picking up people and taking them where they want. Again, this is a problem here sometimes because let's say you live in a neighborhood where there are not a lot of many rich people. So it might be hard for you to get one of these red sharing things uh, if there's no regulation. Uh, so the pool borrowers, let's say, of New York have a worse service of Uber than the bear neighborhoods of New York. And it's hard for you to get out of there. You don't get a, a cheap fare. Uh, so it's kind of unfair. Yeah. So there are problems with fairness as well. Uh, with that in mind. And now we can see this kind of AI used also in public policy. So they use AI for making judicial decisions indirectly. So there's a criminal in front of the court or a less criminal and uh, just some data or some summary of the criminal. And this summary is based on some statistics and some AI algorithm. And it's not very transparent what this algorithm does. It might be unfair with respect to something. And, and they're even using it for things like, let's say, intelligent policing. So they say, well, there's crime there, so let's send police there somehow. But the problem is that if you do that, well, if you only send police where you think there's crime and you don't send police anywhere else, then you will not detect crime anywhere else. You only detect the crime when you send the police. Right? So this is another way that things can be unfair. And they're also using it for public health reasons. And it's fine, it's okay. But you have to be careful because there are some things, especially about health, uh, that are very private. And one of the challenges of applying very, very large scale machine learning techniques is that it's very easy to leak information about somebody uh, through the output of your algorithm. Yeah. So these are all things we will look at a little bit. And the main things of this course, we also look at some other things that I haven't mentioned, like causality. And, but especially for the first part, we look at privacy and fairness. And towards the end, we'll talk a little bit about decisions that are sequential by controlling a dynamic system, and then we'll talk a little bit about safety. Okay, so let's see. Does this work? It seems to work. Hopefully. Okay, so what can we do with machine learning these days? Well, we can learn from data. So there's this classical unsupervised learning problem where you have a bunch of documents, you throw them in some uh, machine learning algorithm, and what you get is this word cloud. It's basically a way to summarize the data. So you can say that uh, it gives some statistic about the data, or it's a simple model of, of the data it has seen. And there are many other similar applications, like compression and uh, stuff like that. But this is what people usually call unsupervised learning. It's a type of learning problem, where you want to summarize the data essentially that you see. It's a meaningful way. Another thing that you can do is, of course, use, uh, be able to recognize people from photographs, be able to understand what they say, be able to understand where they are. This is what you usually call a supervised learning problem. And we will basically start the course with these types of problems. And the more important thing is what you want to do if your machine, uh, how can you make a machine be really autonomous? So this kind of problem so far, you specify what you want to extract from the data, and you get your supervised learning problem uh, solution. You want to specify what you want to predict from the data, and you get your supervised learning problem solution. But ideally, if you have some intelligent agent that has to learn from experience, you want the agent to be able to just go around the world, experiment, get observations from experiments, and then learn how to behave. So let's say that your agent is a mouse or a rat and it's in some maze and it takes actions in this maze, like moving around. And then every time it moves around, it sees something like a wall or some piece of cheese, something like that. And what it wants to do is, it wants to maximize the reward it receives from the environment every step. So at every step, you get some reward. You can think of it like this. If you have cheese, you have no reward. If you have, if, sorry, if you have cheese, you have some reward. If you have no cheese, you have no reward. You want to maximize the amount of cheese you eat until you die. It's quite simple as a problem. That's what you want to do if you're a mouse. Um, but this kind of problem is very, very general, and you can frame most of other artificial intelligence problems 
our sister of Rumi. And in some way, this is not a good idea because it's too general a problem, but it also uh, relates to uh, science, as I will explain later. So you can also use these days, you can use machines to make complex plants. So there are AI algorithms that can play very good, uh, very well in board games like Go. And it's actually very simple how you do it. You basically have a state uh, of what you know about the game right now. It's basically this um, uh, state of the board right now, like, like you can go. And then you uh, imagine possible future moves of what you might do. Let's say you say, I play X, and then my opponent might play O there, or there, or if I play X there, then the opponent might play O there, or there, or there. So you imagine possible positions. And by enumerating every possible position, in theory, you can, say you can solve the game. Of course, in practice, you don't solve this problem completely, but you do some approximate version of that. But it still is enough for machines to outperform humans in most of these games now. Now, what I would like to lead into now is uh, how can you view machine learning as a scientific process? So right now, I showed many AI applications. But what is the most interesting for this course is uh, how do you use machine learning for science. So before I talk about science, let's talk about a bit more fun. So let's say you go to the casino, yeah? You want to gain money, right? Well, you can't probably, but let's say there is one machine there that, that where you can make money, okay? But which one is it? You can't know, right? So what's the strategy for playing? Let's say there are only these uh, one, two, three, four, five, six machines. So what's the strategy for playing these machines? Let's say you have uh, 1,000 corners, and each machine has one corner. So how many times do you do that? How many coins do you spend until you say I uh, will go to that machine? Until I see that one of them is winning one of the other. Okay. Then. And, then and then you switch to that machine. Yeah. And you not go never go back. No. No, okay. <laughs> but, but you might have been just it's unlucky, right? Maybe. maybe you were just unlucky, right? So you can think about this as, let's say, not playing machines in the casino, but let's say, testing drugs. Let's say there are six drugs, and there are a thousand patients. And well, you can randomly assign a drug to every patient. That's what people do, right, most of the time. But maybe some people start to die, okay? This is not a joke. They, they must start to die, okay? There is a protocol for that. If people start to die, then there is a revision, they stop the trial, okay? But let's say you want to be a bit more efficient. You want not to just not kill anybody or kill as few people as you like, but you have a thousand people, the disease maybe is very rare, and maybe you would like to treat these people if possible. So you test, let's say, a few people in the beginning, and then a few more, and then the drug that seems promising, you, you assign it more often, but you never stop assigning the other drugs, just in case you were lucky or unlucky, and maybe some people had a special characteristic, and they got treated because of this. So, it's very hard to do this in practice with real people, but you can do something similar when for chemical analysis of drugs. Okay. So imagine you have a robot, this new kid was called Adam, and this robot can test drugs in different ways. The main way you test drugs is see if they are toxic. It's very important. And there are billions of combinations of molecules, so of so atoms make molecules that might be useful. So depending on how you combine them, you get different effects. There is no way to predict exactly what you need to get. But there are some interesting tests you can do just to rule out very bad effects. Okay. And you can also see if some com com compounds have some specific effect, like targeting uh, specific bacteria, for example. So if you have a very nice setup where you can grow bacteria the way you like uh, and then test individually drugs against the bacteria, then you basically have a way of doing automatic science for drug discovery. Okay. So people have started doing that a little bit. And you can see this as a kind of like the bandit problem. So you start with some compounds. So you can randomly create them. And they are described in some way, uh, but I have no idea how to describe but in some with some features. And then you have to select some of these compounds to test. This can be selected by a human or by a machine. Here we would like to do it by a machine, because there are too many. There's no way a single human can just go through all of them and say, I will test this and this and this. Then you go, you put them in this robot machine and test them, and it sees some result. 
And then it says, well, it's active or inactive. So in this case, we care about whether the drug is active against what we want to target, let's say malaria, or inactive. In this case, it's useless. Then we can do more tests. So after we have seen this, then the interesting thing is that from the data, we can actually try and guess which other compounds might be active. So initially, you don't know anything. You try a few drugs. See, these are active, these are inactive. So maybe some more of them, if I try, they might be active. So you can have a better uh, idea of what can be active by testing more drugs. So how do we do this? How do we think about this in a kind of high-level way? So the idea is you have some hypothesis to start from. Drugs are either active or not active, and these drugs are probably more active, and these drugs are probably less active. So this is your hypothesis. And then you say, well, let's do an experiment. Let's take these drugs and put them in this, uh, in this uh, dish with some other uh, with some pathogen and see how much uh, the pathogen reduces or increases after one day. And then your conclusion is basically, okay, these types of drugs seem to work better, and these types of drugs or something like that. Okay. I will go to a more specific example that's more fun. Um, back, back in the old days, uh, people thought that everything was revolving around the Earth. Apart from some exceptions, there were some plants that had some other things going around them. So Tafo Brahe uh, basically did a bunch of measurements of Mars using just his eye and a very, a very simple mechanical instrument. And over many years, see, it was very patient. So he's looking at Mars, taking a Looking a point there, and so on. And then he said, from this data, he said, okay, this must be the orbit of Mars. Okay. Now the interesting thing here is that okay, I can't see very well. This is Mars. So from this data, basically, he fitted one specific circle around the Earth that seemed to fit the data the best. Okay. But of course, it was a specific type of mistake. He had this original hypothesis that everything is revolving around the Earth and everything is circular orbit because of the model of the universe had over time. And then when I tried to fit the data, and he said, well, if it was a circle and if it's around the Earth, then this is the, the right circle. Okay? So the conclusion was wrong because the original hypothesis was wrong. Then Kepler had an alternative hypothesis saying, well, we can maybe things revolve around the sun and maybe the, the orbits are elliptic, not perfect circles. Okay. So using exactly the same data, had a very different conclusion for every of the one of the orbits. So this is very, very old stuff. But again, here actually Kepler didn't, wasn't very honest in some way. Uh, so the way that he filled the data was in such a way as to um, accentuate the eccentricity of the of these uh, curves. So these are much less elliptic curves than you think. They are quite close to circular. It's pretty hard to detect. And from the data that he had, it was quite of noise, it was very difficult to actually tell uh, whether that's circular or not. But many years later, Gauss basically invented the first procedure for, for doing this, the least square estimation procedure, and he used this for fitting data for a much smaller object, a satellite, I think, of uh, think of Ceres. And basically, it was the first uh, statistics uh, done without really fiddling around with the numbers. Okay. So this is the kind of stuff that uh, we'd like to be able to do. Now we're going to do this with machines. You don't have to do it by hand. Uh, but you still have to make sure that, first of all, you have the right hypothesis space. So, so or, the, or that the hypothesis space includes the truth. If your hypothesis space is completely bullshit, sorry, uh, then no matter what you do with your algorithm, then you will not get anything useful. Then, of course, the algorithm that you apply has to be the right type of algorithm, or the model that you apply has to be right. And then the conclusion that you draw from it has to, is kind of a human interpretation thing. So interpreting some, the results of your algorithm is kind of difficult. It requires a, a kind of uh, imagination state. So for example, if you have a wrong hypothesis and you apply a model uh, with a wrong hypothesis, you get some results that, that are meaningless, but you will not be able to know that unless you already knew that the hypothesis was wrong. So for example, here, type of, well, if this is what I get, this seems to fit the data, that's the result. He didn't try and make the leap say, well, maybe I was wrong. Okay. This kind of stuff is repeated all the time, these mistakes. So uh, I don't remember exactly where uh, this just happened, but it was very common in the past to have 
what's so-called fMRI studies, functional microwave regression simulation studies. And these are kind of simple. What you do is you take the brain of somebody, well, not just the brain, the whole person, you put them in an MRI machine, and you have them do some tasks, like see an emails, count, or whatever. And then you look at the difference in uh, blood flow in different regions of the brain relative to the statistical average. Okay. Now, if you saw uh, pictures of Jennifer Lopez on one hand, and you saw pictures of, I don't know, a bottle of wine on the other, and, and you measure the brain activity, you see that there's probably some difference. And people used to do the studies a lot, and they said, well, it seems like this region of the brain calls for Jennifer Lopez, and this region of the brain calls for a bottle of wine. But maybe it was not so. So actually, a lot of times, because of the way that they used the kind of methods that they used to analyze the data, they just got random noise, in fact. Uh, lots of the fluctuations you see in the brain are just fluctuations that have no particular meaning, um, and they can be delayed or uh, after the stimulus quite a long time. Uh, so one group of researchers did this task. So they had a salmon, you all know salmon, and it was dead. And they showed the salmon two types of images. One was humans that are happy, and the other was humans that are sad. Okay? And they used the same techniques that people used to analyze Jennifer Lopez neurons. And they found there's this region in the brain of the dead salmon that seems to encode for happy people versus sad. Okay? So, of course, the only explanation here is that the method that they used okay, was, not, was not an incorrect method, it was just wrongfully applied or the results of the method were not correctly interpreted. Okay? So there is a difference, but the explanation of the difference is not that the salmon recognizes happy people, it's just there was too much noise uh, compared to the actual signal there. Okay? It's, it's very easy to make this mistake. Uh, believe me. Okay, so the other part that I would like to talk about is Let's say planning future experiments. Okay, so let's say you take a dead salmon and you put it in your, in your machine and, and you see these neurons, right? Uh, activating, apparently. Do you have a next thing to do? Let's say you believe that it's true, or it might be true. Do you want to do something else afterwards? Or do you just accept it and publish? This uh, dead salmon can predict uh, human happiness. Feel free to say anything like So you're a scientist, you put a dead salmon in because, I don't know, you, you have a theory that it might be able to recognize people. You see this, ah, there's this region of the brain in this particular salmon that seems to be active. Do you want to test this somehow again? Uh, yeah. What we test in different pictures? Different pictures, same salmon, or different salmon, yeah, yeah, or something like that, yeah. Do the experiment again or ask somebody else to do it. Yeah, you can do it again. Yeah. Something like that. Or maybe if it's something more interesting, then you can say, well, I see that the orbit of Ceres can find a little bit around, uh, I don't know, what is this planet called anymore? Jupiter, I think. But uh, I can measure it a little bit, but I cannot really be sure about it. So I will apply for a grant of $1 billion to get a, a new telescope to get better measurements, for example. Right? So you could do things like that. So when you say new experiment, I would say really doing a completely new thing it can be really complicated or it can be really simple. Yeah? And the reason why you want to do a new experiment is that this seems to be an in interesting proof to find out whether it's true or not. So uh, by spending the money, you say you, you get something important. Okay? But how do you plan experiments? Yeah, say we can plan 100,000 different experiments, right? So, so let's say in the beginning you have done an experiment and you, you want to decide what experiment to do. So let's say that the experiments and the results of the experiments are like a tic-tac-toe board. So let's say a place where you place X is what experiment you do. Okay? And then you get a response from nature. So nature is your opponent. It's not really an opponent, but uh, it responds. So you place something and there is a response. Um, and then depending on how it responds, you can plan another experiment. So what you can do is you can formulate this in a, in a probabilistic way. Uh, by calculating probabilities for different responses of nature based on what you know right now. And specifically, you can apply this to the, to the game of predicting drugs. So you can have a model for which drugs are good and which drugs are bad. 
and then you can say, well, if I test this drug here, then I might get this result or that result. And because you have a model, you have probability specifically for what will happen. And then when you see this result, then your model will change. So here implicitly you change your model in the future, depending on what you will see in the future. So the idea of this is you can plan experiments by anticipating every possible knowledge gain you could have from the experiment. And by doing so, you are much more optimal than just doing random experiments. So there's a way of doing experiments that is a maximally informative way for finding uh, the truth. So this was applied by Eve, the second group of scientists, by the same people. And while the first one was kind of basic, this one really tried to incorporate this principle at a very simple level. So it only tried to do like one step to the head. That was basically the same principle I had again. And it actually managed to discover, without having any prior information, a malaria drug. Okay. It rediscovered it, it was already known. But I didn't know before. Okay. Um, so that was a success story. I don't think it has actually much to, to find something because uh, to find something you have to do, say, well, this is a candidate, and then you have to do clinical trials and so on. So this will kind of reverse find. Uh, but it's still kind of promising. And this was already probably five years ago, I think. So um, I think things have moved on quite a lot since then. Now, what I'm going to talk about in this course, uh, mainly a lot of things like trying to avoid pitfalls, like make sure you have the right model class when you're treating your model, make sure that you're really trying to solve the right problem and not the wrong problem. This is very common as well. And um, again, correcting the technical conclusions, especially in the beginning of the course, we go through a lot of that, and using a, a good testing methodology. These are things we'll focus on now in the beginning, in the first couple of weeks, and then we'll, of course, uh, kind of reinforce them along the course. But the main course subject itself is societal aspects of machine learning, and mainly privacy uh, initially. So let's say you want to apply for credit okay, at the bank, and it gets rejected or it gets accepted, I don't know. But from the very fact that you apply, if somebody knows that you apply for credit, then they learn something about your financial situation. If they learn that you applied and get rejected, then they also learn something. And you can think about it more generally, uh, any kind of problem where you are using some statistical algorithm to make decisions that are public, people see, or can leak information about individuals that participate in this uh, program. So if, for example, I wanted to ask uh, how many of you take drugs, and I just somehow got a number out of it, I would still be able to guess if a specific one of you might take drugs if I knew whether or, or not everybody else was taking drugs. And we'll go through that at some point in the future. The other thing is fairness, I mentioned it already, and here we'll go on to an application on, uh, I think I haven't really decided on it, but uh, social network application where you have a social network or a simple model of a social network and you want to have a job market so that people have skills, people have, uh, uh, employers have skills that they want and then people get masked in this job market and you'd like to have a fair process. So let's say people from, uh, let's say you want to have, for example, gender equality. It's very common uh, as a thing. Uh, so how do you maintain gender equality? Uh, what does it make sense? Why it's better for the employer not to have the general quality? Yeah, things like that. The other thing that is societal is safety. And we focus a bit on the medicine problem. So how do you develop drugs that are safe in the sense that uh, you don't just want to maximize the more number of people that get better expectation. You also want to limit the risk that a small subset of population would have adverse side effects, for example. So you would like to have that as well. And, and because we're doing this in this kind of very complicated situation, decision making setting, uh, we'd also like uh, uh, said to take uh, possible future decisions into account. But these are the basic uh, things, and then there are a couple of things that we'll talk about that are more technical. Uh, the first is supervised learning problems. Uh, supervised learning problems. We kind of already mentioned that, and reinforcement learning problems. We'll actually start with this one and then move to that one. 
So this one we use mainly for some classification and simple decision making problems like giving credit or not giving credit to somebody. And this will be part of one lab. And the second one will be a supervised learning. And here you basically go through analyzing uh, people's preferences in a social network. And the last one is reinforcement learning and everything that is connected to that, specifically experiment design for, for uh, drug discovery. Now, there are some algorithms. This is not an algorithm focused course, but we will talk about some algorithms. So I will talk about Bayesian inference. What does it mean in graphical models? We will go through the very basic Bayesian inference algorithm uh, for the simplest case. Uh, because neural networks are in fashion, I will actually talk a little bit about neural networks, but only a very, very short amount. And finally, again, I will talk about something relatively simple, this backwards induction, which is something that we use for uh, sequential decision problems, like this drug discovery problem. Okay. So, yeah. So, this is the, f the course we look for a perfectly regular schedule, and it kind of depends a little bit on how fast everybody is going and uh, the material. I have booked more classes than are necessary for the course. Uh, but there's a schedule that is right now more or less seems okay. Uh, and what I think about is we have the first two weeks we kind of have to do a mixture of lab lectures. And then after that will be one week more lecture oriented and the other week more lab oriented. Because the main way you get examined in this course is through three assignments or three mini projects. Yeah. And these mini projects would require you to spend some time in groups and discussing and implementing some things and things like that. Okay. So the mini projects are basically these ones. And I'm not quite sure about the second one, but okay. And the first one is credit risk. So here you have some person that applies for a loan and you know something about them, like uh, how old they are and how much money they have and stuff. And you want to say yes or no to the credit. And from the point of view of the bank, you want to maximize your profit, of course. Yeah. But there are some regulations that you want to keep as well, so you cannot just do that. Um, the other one is analyzing social networks and we mainly focus on the problem of uh, recommendation systems where you go to Facebook or whatever and see some things that might you might be interested in. Uh, using news stories, let's say, or, or whatever advertisements for products. And we go through that and at the end, towards the end of that, it might be a good idea to uh, look at detecting fake news uh, uh, outlets. Let's say. But I think I might give you a free hand on that for what you exactly want to do. Um, and the last one is uh, kind of the more technical one of, of the three is about sequential problems. So there you have the specific model of, uh, of drug uh, effectivity, effectiveness, and you would like to be able to predict which drugs are good, and you would like to design an experiment so as to be able to test the most efficiently as possible which is the best drug. So these are the kind of three things we will uh, talk about. It's not very much uh, AI oriented in the sense that we're not going to talk about a lot of algorithms. But if you do want to talk about a lot of algorithms, it's a deep learning. I know there is a course that is specifically about deep learning. Uh, I think well, there was. Uh, it goes through a lot of algorithms. So you can uh, do a of it. There is a, a statistics course that is focusing more on regression and classification, I think, that is uh, parallel to this course that people in the data science curriculum should be taking. So we will have a small overlap with that course, uh, but not so much. Okay, so we have a few minutes more. So I can start with talking about nearest neighbors. So let's say you have two bacteria, okay? And one is VDX and one is VDT. I don't know what they mean, I'm just a data analyst, so that's really what the way it happens. You're analyzing some data, somebody says this is the data, and I want to be able to discriminate between those two types of bacteria. And the data you have in this case are spectral data. It's a mass spectrometer. I think what you do is you throw the bacteria in there and blast it with some uh, radiation, and you get some chaos somehow. Uh, I don't know how it works with students. Uh, so anyway, but these spectral characteristics tell you something about the chemical composition of, of every bacteria. 
the one that is in there. And what you really see this testing for is you see it for airports and stuff. So some not in the EU but in Japan, for example, when you have a liquid, they test it and say, oh, there's no explosive there, so you take it. Uh, so you can do the same thing here. So basically, you can identify the material, but for biological organisms, it's a bit difficult. It's not the same as, let's say, a certain chemical that you do for an explosive. So every time you test, uh, you analyze a specific bacterium, you get a slightly different uh, thing. Maybe because of mutation, I don't know. But you get a different thing. So on average, what you get is this blue curve here. And this red curve here shows you the variability uh, in the spectrum. And for the other one, you see a slightly different curve as well. OK. So now, if you would like to can uh, also differentiate those two things. It's not very difficult. In fact, if you see this as a vector, it's basically a 250 dimensional vector. And if you somehow project into two uh, dimensions, you already see that even in two dimensions, these uh, two classes are, of bacteria are kind of distinct. So they only meet somewhere around here. Uh, but otherwise, probably you can uh, be able to draw the line between them, so to speak. Okay, so how do you uh, do that in practice? Well, one way to do it is to see the distance between the two in terms of how the spectra differ. Yeah. So now this two-dimensional seems easy, but you have two hundred dimensions, it's harder to visualize. So one way to visualize is uh, you have your spectral data. You have one curve like this and the other like this. You look at the difference in the, in the two curves, this line here. So the total area between those Two curves is basically your uh, your difference, okay. your L one norm difference. Anyway, so you can use this as a comparison. And what does the K nearest neighbor algorithm do? It looks at the difference between the data points in terms of uh, the distance. And when you ask it which class of bacteria does this new point belong to, it basically looks at the distance between the new point and the old point. Okay. And then what it does is it looks at the label of every point. So here we have two labels only. And it counts the number of times the label is class one, and plus the number of times the label is class two. And it says what's the average number of times you are class one or class two. And this is a model estimate for the probability of being one class or the other. So it's kind of a simple algorithm. And it has two parameters. It's kind of important. The first is the neighborhood. So how many neighbors should I consider? And the other is the distance. How do you measure the distance between two points? So if you go to this point slide here, well, OK, we uh, have two dimensions. Well, say, let's say I have a new point here, and I can measure the distance between one neighbor. The first neighbor is this one. So then I will just decide uh, blue. Or I can measure two points, and then it will be either this one or that one. So I will say 50-50. And if you increase to three, then you say, well, it's Probably one out of three is going to be here, and two out of three is going to be the green one, and so on. But here I'm kind of assuming that there's a distance, and the distance is the Euclidean distance in this dimensional space. Yeah. So if you change the distance, then the result is different. So this can, can cause problems. Okay, so <laughs> let's think about this algorithm, what does it do? Uh, for any new point, it looks at all the existing points from which know the labels, and it counts the, from the neighbors the number of points that are in every class, right? So if you have t points in total, and you look at t neighbors, that means that you're looking at every possible point in the data set, right? So then what would the algorithm say, do you think, for any new point? So let's go back here. So you have a new point somewhere, yeah? And you have Normally, what you see is you've got the k closest neighbors. Let's say if you are here, you've got this k closest neighbors, 4. And you look at the class, and you count the number of times it's one class versus the other class. So here, all the neighbors are green. Yeah, so you say 100% green. So you say that the number of neighbors that you look at is the total number of points that you see here. So it's everything. Yeah. So then what does the algorithm say? If you have any point, yeah? Whichever there is more. Whichever there is more, right. Yeah. And in this particular version of the algorithm, we say that we don't just count, but we actually calculate the ratio. So we say if it is 50 points from one class and 6 from the other, which is 50 over 110. Probability for one class and 6 over 110 for the other class. So that's how we work, okay? So we see that if we increase this k, then 
we get a very specific result. And if we decrease it, we can ve get very sensitive to uh, what is the closest neighbor. So if the class are overlapping a lot, then you would like to use a k that is larger, so it can kind of smooth out. And if they're not overlapping so much, then a small k should be okay. But it all depends kind of on this distance and how you use it. Okay? So, um, uh, historical note, these two people there, they were the uh, originators of this method. And they not only invented, but they also analyzed these properties. So, uh, it's pretty thorough work, I would say. I have not actually read the paper, but it's quite long. So, they did quite a thorough work, I think. Um, so, that's before we break, let's leave you with this question. Yeah. What do you think is the type of, let's say you have a new bacterium, right? You don't know what it is, okay? But you want to test it, and you have this data already from these two bacteria. So what type of bacteria do you think it's going to be? Blue. Anything else? What do you think is blue? Do you want to rephrase your conclusion a little bit? So you have, we know that these green points are one class and these red points are blue points are another class. And we have a new point, we don't know what it is. Yeah. And then if we know that it's either one of those two, then it's probably going to be blue. But if we didn't know that, so we just have a new bacteria, we don't know what it is, it might not even be any one of those two, right? It could be something completely different. Now, so a lot of times it's very common to confuse the classification problem something else. So a lot of times what you have is let's say in intrusion detection you say, well, I have these five hundred different viruses that I have data for and I did that classifier and now I want to have new emails so I can check whether or not they have a virus. This is not true. What you have is you can test if they are one of the known viruses, but not if it's completely unknown one. Right. So a lot of people do this mistake a lot of times and classification problem works okay. Uh, but in this course we see it more as a more general decision problem. So you're allowed to say, well, I don't know what this is. Let's ask somebody else, uh, for example. Or um, uh, it's probably, yeah, it's probably an unknown type of bacterium, or I don't know what. So I know that a lot of old machine learning, especially folks, a lot of investigation, and I know they still do, especially in vision. Uh, but if you see it more generally as a decision problem, where you have some data that you have seen before, but you know it's some specific class, let's say. It's a class of people that managed to pay their loan back, and people that didn't pay their loan back. Now you are a credit risk uh, manager in, in some bank. Well, your decision is not whether or not this person would have returned the loan or not. It's like, should I give this person money or not? It's, it's a different thing, right? And the same thing with, with any classification problem. Okay, maybe this is a very stretching example a little bit, but uh, it's kind of a thing. Okay, so the last thing is that, yeah, so we do have probability for every class from the original algorithm uh, or for the counts and from the counts we can just pick like I said before pick the class that has the highest probability or the highest number of counts we don't have to do that right we could just randomly select according to this or if there's a different cost from making different types of mistakes about the class then take that into account as well so maybe if we misidentify strain 1 for strain 2 it's okay but if we do the other around it's bad same thing with the loans. If we misidentify somebody as not worth of a loan, as worth of a loan is bad, but the other way around is, is good. Yeah. So the standard way to do it is like this, but this is only the standard way, and it depends on the application if you want to do that. Okay, so hands on with the passing console after the break. You don't have a computer, but uh, I will do the hands on myself. <laughs>